Welcome to Science and Christianity, Part 4, The Big Bang versus Divine Creation. In the early 20th century, our understanding of the universe took a quantum leap. For the first time, with the aid of large-scale telescopes, astronomers realized that the universe consisted of countless galaxies, that is, star systems, beyond our own. The vastness of ethereal space, stretching millions, even billions of light years, has forced humans to ponder the perennial religious and philosophical question, from whom or from what comes the cosmos? Between 1912 and 1920, astronomer Vesto M. Slipher discovered that the spectral lines of some distant galaxies, called nebula at that time, showed a significant shift toward the red end of the spectrum, that is, the longer wavelengths. This suggested that these galaxies are moving away from us at extremely high speeds. In order to understand this discovery and its significance, we need to do a little astronomy. The Doppler effect enables us to measure the speed of objects in space with a high degree of accuracy. As the diagram on the left shows, when an object which is giving off wave energy, such as sound or light, is moving toward you, the waves are compressed. For sound, this produces a higher pitch. For light, shown in the diagram on the upper right, there is a shift toward the blue end of the spectrum. The opposite is true when the object is moving away. The waves are stretched, producing a lower pitch, and light shifts toward the red end of the spectrum. The faster the object is moving, the more noticeable the effect will be. As shown on the lower right, the use of chemical lines in the spectra of stars enables precise measurement of this Doppler shift. As stars move away, the line will shift toward the red end of the spectrum. As stars move toward us, the lines will shift toward the blue end of the spectrum. These shifts are then compared to the spectrum of a non-moving source, which is shown in the rest frame on top. Spectroscopic measurements during the 1920s indicated that the galactic redshift increased with estimated distance. So, the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it recedes from us. Using this information, Edwin Hubble determined in 1929 that the universe was rapidly expanding in every direction. This was a watershed moment in astronomy. And there in the upper right you can see a photo of Hubble, never without his pipe, and the 100-inch telescope he used at the Mount Wilson Observatory. In 1931, a Belgian cosmologist, Georges Lemaitre, proposed a new theory which suggested that this rapid expansion, when played backwards, indicated that the universe began as a compact object which must have exploded, propelling matter at incredible velocities. By the 1960s, with evidence mounting, the so-called Big Bang Theory was finally accepted as the standard model of cosmic origins, more than 30 years after Lemaitre first proposed it. Many religious conservatives have condemned the Big Bang Theory as an atheistic cosmology which stands against the biblical story of origins. I teach astronomy online for an Orthodox Christian school. Most of my students hold that position when they begin my astronomy class. And there are plenty of outspoken atheist scientists who happily agree. In his book, The Grand Design, the late Stephen Hawking claimed that the Big Bang is a consequence of the laws of physics alone. Science makes God unnecessary. The physical laws which stand behind the theory of quantum mechanics and relativity enable the universe to create itself from nothing. Cosmologist and quantum physicist Lawrence Krauss, in his book A Universe from Nothing, contends that quantum physics has become so advanced that we no longer need to appeal to a divine creator. According to quantum theory, the universe emerged out of the so-called nothing of an unstable quantum vacuum. Atheist biologist Richard Dawkins calls quantum theory the knockout blow against the last remaining trump card of the theologian who asks, why is there something rather than nothing. But you haven't yet heard the rest of the story. You see, Georges Lemaitre, who originated the Big Bang Theory, was a Catholic priest. His view of the universe was anything but atheistic. He regarded the Big Bang as being compatible with his Catholic belief in a creator. In his famous book, God and the Astronomers, astronomer Robert Jastrow documents how the Big Bang was not embraced warmly by many 20th century astronomers because it sounded too much like Genesis. The idea that the universe had a definite, 
cataclysmic beginning instead of existing eternally has too many biblical overtones, which caused some scientists to reject it out of hand. As Jastro explains, the Big Bang never purports to tell us how the matter of the universe came into being or why this compact object became unstable and exploded. Those questions lie beyond our physics. The theory only explains the emerging structure of the universe after the explosion. In the now famous conclusion of his book, Jastro writes, At this moment it seems as though science will never be able to raise the curtain on the mystery of creation. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. Jastrow, who was an agnostic, believed that Genesis provides deep insights into the cosmological question. The details differ, he says, but the essential elements in the astronomical and biblical accounts of Genesis are the same. The difference between Genesis and the Big Bang also demonstrates the complementary nature of these two accounts. Whereas Genesis 1-1 begins with the formation of the Earth, the Big Bang is concerned with the state of the universe prior to the Earth, the solar system, and the stars. Whereas Genesis is anthropocentric and theocentric, science is physiocentric, that is physical, and mechanistic. Most importantly, whereas Genesis is concerned with who created the universe and why it exists, science is only concerned with how and when it was created. What about the atheists? So-called new atheists like Krauss and Hawking claim the universe appeared out of nothing, like a giant mallet pulled from the hidden pocket of a cartoon character. But nothing in their theory does not mean absolute nothing. Rather, it includes, at bottom, pre-existing laws of quantum mechanics, as if these laws were a creative force. So even the new atheists are forced to admit that the Greek philosophers were right. Ex nihilo, nihil fit. From nothing, nothing comes. To violate this law would contradict the basic scientific belief in cause and effect, placing science on the level of magic. So we ask, how does a physical law create matter and energy? Laws are mathematical relationships that describe behavior. Do Newton's equations create gravity? Do the Earth's latitude and longitude lines which describe a sphere cause the Earth to be spherical? Most importantly of all, in the end, how does a belief in an invisible law with the power to create differ from the belief in an invisible God with the power to create? If one, why not the other? We can't help but wonder if the new atheists, like their predecessors who opposed the Big Bang, harbor a visceral, if not irrational, fear or loathing of a personal God, and use science as a cover for their philosophical beliefs, as Robert Jastrow observed many years ago. This brings us face to face with the limits of science. Science is a tool for exploring the natural world. It is limited to analyzing matter and energy and must plead ignorance when addressing any metaphysical questions beyond that. When scientists advocate atheism or materialism, they are exceeding the limits of science and abusing their authority. They are speaking as philosophers, not scientists. When scientists presume to tell us what is moral and what is right, as they often do regarding issues of sexuality, they are exceeding the limits of science and abusing their authority. They are speaking as philosophers, not scientists. God, in his essence, is not a physical being that can be studied by science or a mathematical equation that can be analyzed. Consequently, we must look elsewhere for a different kind of evidence, beginning with prayer and the resurrection of Christ. Yes, mind is the instrument which connects us with the invisible laws of creation, but prayer is the instrument which connects us with the Creator himself. And in the resurrection of Christ we see the divine and human spirit surpassing the bounds of the material universe and the laws which govern it, leaving our primitive science behind. For on that Sunday morning, when Christ rose from the dead, a new creation began with a flash of uncreated light, a second big bang, which ushered in a new cosmic order 
reversing the power of decay and entropy which brought death to the old cosmos. It was and is an event even more marvelous and vast than the first Big Bang. And now you know the rest of the story. As an epilogue to this series, I hope you will reflect on the role that humility plays in both religion and science. In the Orthodox tradition, humility is called the mother of all virtues, and pride is named the cause of all sin. And so there is a certain responsibility that Christians have in approaching science and approaching the facts of nature with an attitude of humility. But scientists are also responsible for exercising humility in the awareness of their own fallibility and in the conscientious rejection of drawing philosophical conclusions from their theories. Thank you for watching Science and Christianity, the rest of the story.